Okay, thank you. Um, so, I don't think that anyone can overstate the central role that the passwords have in securing our lives and privacy. Uh, anything that is valuable and can be written in bits uh, is protected somehow uh, with uh, passwords. Uh, at the same time, uh, the one, it's undeniable that uh, the state of security of passwords is uh, um, catastrophically bad. But uh, before I, I go into that, uh, let me just uh, tell you about the names of my co-authors. The, 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 the talk touches on several works with subsets uh, from uh, with, uh, authors Stasi Aretsky, Zhao Shu, Agilos Kiayas, Nitesh Saxena, and Malia Shirvanian. Um, so, again, we, we are very dependent of passwords, but passwords like to abandon us. Uh, they are regularly lost and stolen in thousands, millions, hundreds of millions, lately even uh, one billion in a single event. Um, you can go to leaksource.com and see if you are lucky enough to have some of your accounts on, on passwords listed among the three billion passwords they have. It's about one password per internet user. So this is definitely a bad situation and an acceptable state of affairs. And the question is, do we have to live with this or we have better ways? So getting rid of passwords altogether is unrealistic. They are too convenient. They are too massively deployed. Asking users to choose strong, high entropy, independent passwords is equally unrealistic. And the question that we ask here is whether cryptography can help and let me ruin the surprise. The answer is yes. Definitely there are techniques in cryptography that can help improving the, the, the state of insecurity of passwords. Uh, and we will show some examples of different solutions to different problems in different settings. Uh, the nice thing about the, what I'm going to present is that they all, all these solutions use very simple techniques, very well established. Essentially, blind the Diffie Hellman uh, that originates with uh, David Schaum. Ford Kaliski were first to use, it in, use, them, use this technique in the uh, setting of passwords. Uh, and our work uh, has similarities with work done by uh, Boyan. Uh, we will cast this in the more modern uh, terminology of oblivious PRF, but when we implement stuff, we implement it with blind Diffie Hellman. This is mature technology, even if it's not used, it's ready for deployment in the real world. And uh, I'll go over the, such, uh, these solutions very briefly, and I will be very happy to talk to any of you that is interested in the subject, and particularly if people think that they can help uh, transferring some of these things into practice. So the, the main uh, source of uh, uh, password leakage are offline dictionary attacks. Uh, they, they are the product of the deadly combination of uh, uh, low entropy passwords which come out of the uh, inherent limitations of human memory and of server compromise. An attacker that uh, compromises a server gets what we call the password file which contains hashed versions of the user passwords and with the hash of the password, an attacker with a dictionary, a list of, of, of potential passwords can check which of the passwords in the list is actually a particular user's password. Uh, if a user chose the password in, in the dictionary, then it will be found. What makes this very effective is that uh, there is special software and hardware, uh, dedicated hardware to do these exhaustive searches over dictionaries and they can do many, many millions of, uh, of these things per second. So this is a very practical way of breaking these uh, passwords. At the same time, maybe the worst news is that offline dictionary attacks are unavoidable upon server compromise. Whatever the, it doesn't matter what your protocol does and what your algorithm does, if there is a way for the server to check 
the, that the user's password is the user passwords, then the same thing can be done by the attacker with guest uh, passwords. So we have to live with, with this thing. Uh, yet, the, the hope is to be able to make these uh, uh, unavoidable exhaustive attacks ineffective. And we, for that, we either need to use high entropy password or add more uh, elements to the protocol, devices, servers. And so in, in the first part of the talk, I will be talking about a way of taking the burden of choosing and memorizing passwords away from uh, humans, because as long as they have to do that, then low entropy password is, is, is the only option. And for this, we, we, we know the solution. There is the uh, password store or password managers that keep a list of passwords that, that the user can take in a device or access on, uh, uh, retrieve online. And uh, it keeps it uh, encrypted under a master password so that the user only needs to remember that master password. In that sense, uh, this removes the need to remember many complicated passwords, and you can have only one, hopefully non-trivial master password. Now, this is a, this is a good uh, type of solution. In, in practice, the way these things are implemented is not always great. Uh, if you have an, a list of passwords which is encrypted under a master password, an attacker that finds the list can uh, do an offline dictionary attack on the master password, and if it, it finds that master password, it finds also all the passwords of the user. Uh, also, if uh, passwords are in a device or in a server and the, the, uh, the, the attacker is inside that device, then when the user enters the, the master password, it can be learned that way. And again, all the passwords are compromised. Also, there are problems sometimes in the communication between the user and the device. And in addition to all of that, uh, many of these uh, password managers actually store user-chosen passwords, which means, again, uh, somewhat low entropy and uh, repeated among uh, different servers, which is one of the bad things that happen with passwords. So can we do better? Uh, the answer is yes, we can, at least for the next uh, 15 days. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I had it, but I took it because I didn't want to, to spend time there, so now I spend even more saying that I had, let's make passwords great again. <laughs> so, so here is a dream password store. All passwords are kept in the, in, in, in the user's device or online. The user memorizes a single master password, as in any password store. But uh, now all passwords are going to be random and independent of each other, which is the way they should be. But in addition, an attacker that gets hold of the device of the store, uh, or even has full control of the device, learns nothing. Uh, nothing about the individual store passwords, nothing about the master password, okay? So how does that work? First of all, when I say nothing, I mean in an information theoretic nothing. I mean, it's a dream a password store, so we can dream with information th theoretic security. The information store in the device is going to be independent of the master password and independent of the individual uh, passwords. Okay, so you see that you see that storage, and you see nothing about the the, the master password or the individual passwords. The clear the, pa the master password is never entered in clear, clear text way into the device or the server. Uh, so that an eavesdropper that is in the line between user and device does not, not learn anything. Even an attacker that is inside the device at the time that the user is entering or interacting with the device learns nothing, okay? So it's, we call this Sphinx for password store that perfectly hides from itself. You can see this SPHI. What, what about NX? NX stands for no exaggeration. <laughs> okay, so let me show you how this works. Um, so we, 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 we have a, a user, um, user, we have a, a remote server, client machine, and a device. 
the user starts by inputting uh, the master password. PWD will be the master password, which is sent to the device. The device has a PRF key. Okay, so this is a, a scheme based on a PRF. PRF can be HMAC, CBC MAC, or something like that. The password is sent to the device. The device has this key K sub D. It computes the PRF using the key K sub D on the password. This is sent to the terminal, to the client machine. The client machine gets that uh, value of PRF at, and call it RWD. And RWD is actually the, the password which is specific to that uh, server. And now, between the, the client and the server, they run whatever protocol there is there uh, with RWD. So RWD is a pseudo-random password that basically the user had to register initially with the server, I don't think Google, Facebook, your bank, whatever. So each one, each server, that, or, or each account uh, that the user has will have a different RWD, and the way you compute it is, is you add to the PRF computation the URL or some, some identifier of, of that uh, service or, or the account. And we are not making any assumption on the password protocol. We just say RWD will be the, 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 the password protocol. Whatever you use with that server will be used with RWD. OK, so this solution already gives you uh, part of what I wanted. It. One is because RWD is uh, pseudo-random, then offline attacks are infeasible. The, it, the dictionary will be too big to, to run an exhaustive attack on it. Also, the storage here on the device is, is K sub D, which is, was chosen independently of the master password uh, and the, the individual uh, passwords. So the, the, the storage, if you find the storage, you learn K sub D, you, you don't learn uh, anything about the master password. The problem with this solution is that the master password PWD is being sent in the clear to the device, so anyone on the link here or inside the device can read the master password. To avoid that, we move to an oblivious PRF. An oblivious PRF is exactly the same idea, except that now, after getting the password from the user, the client machine, oops, client machine chooses a one-time key with which it encrypts the password, okay? So now the, the, the password goes encrypted to the device. The device does something with that, and the outputs an encryption under that same key of the PRF value, okay? Now, for doing that, the device does not need to decrypt the password. It does not decrypt the password, and it does not learn the PRF value either because the PRF value is generated already in encrypted form, this is where the magic of cryptography comes into play. And if we have that, then we are OK, because now the encrypted PRF is only learned by the client machine that has that one-time key that decrypts the PRF, gets RWD, and it's being used as before. So as before, because RWD is pseudo-random, then offline attacks are infeasible because uh, the storage in the device is still independent of the passwords. But now we also have the master password hidden over the wire and uh, from the device. So this is nice. Uh, the only question is how do we implement something like this, OK? So uh, if you know about fully homomorphic encryption, that's one implementation. This is not what I would have called mature and, uh, and efficient uh, technology. So instead, we'll do something simpler than that. Here is the implementation. User enters the password. The, the, the client chooses a one-time value R. Oh, so, sorry, let me say first that how, how do we define this particular OPRF? The particular OPRF takes the PWD, the password, hashes into an element in some uh, predefined group, and the key KD is an exponent, OK, uh, on on that, on that group, and the OPRF on PWD is hash the PWD, raise it to the power of KD. That's the OPRF. So now we, we go back to, uh, to our client machine, which uses this random uh, exponent R, uh, 
And what it does, it takes uh, the hash of the password, it got the password from the, from the user, and raises to the power of R. We call that uh, value A. All that the device has to do is to take A and just raise it to the pay power of KD. When the, uh, when the client machine gets uh, the value B, it raises it to the power of 1 over R, which uh, basically cancels the R in step two, and what it gets is HPWD to the KD, which is how we define the OPRF. Okay, and now we can use RWD with the server. As before, RWD is pseudo-random, then there is no offline attacks. KD is independent of PWD and of RWD. Uh, but now, we have that the master password is perfectly hidden on the wire and from the device. And I say perfect in the sense of Shannon uh, security because the, the use of this exponent R essentially works as a one-time pad here and nothing, information theoretically, uh, is, is uh, leaked on, on the password. So essentially, this is the dream. Uh, 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 password store that uh, I was talking about, and th that's it. That's, that's all you need. Now, so, and, and this can work with any client server password protocol. It's server transparent. And not, not only secure, the performance between client and uh, the, the communication between client and device is just a single round. Uh, send the uh, hash of PWD to the R, gets back this value to the KD, and that's it. It's one exponentiation for the device, two exponentiations for the client, and one hash into uh, the group. Uh, any Diffie-Hellman group, uh, uh, well, I mean, we need something called the one more Diffie-Hellman assumption, but you know, basically any Diffie-Hellman group, we, are, we, we believe this is this uh, holds there. So you can choose a Diffie-Hellman group that is best for this type of operations. Uh, so we, we, we've taken these ideas and built actually a password manager that we call Sphinx. Uh, we show an implementation as an Android app, a usability study. I will not be giving references to papers uh, uh, during the talk. At the end, I have a, a URL with a page where you will find an annotated uh, references for, for, for the talk because I'm touching on, on quite a few works. A server transparent, so you can, it's uh, Facebook or Google or your employer does not need to know that you are using this uh, store because again, the, the password, the, the, the password protocol can be anything. There is no need to have any means of protecting the channel between the client and device. You don't need physical security, you don't need extra keys and you can use any form of communication, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, internet, whatever. And what is very nice is that this allows for a, a implementation where the device is implemented online, which you can use instead of the device, so as a backup to the device, or both of them together. Uh, and you get all these, uh, all, all, all these properties on, on, on this online solution. Uh, to summarize uh, the security, at point device compromise, you get unconditional security. The only thing after the attacker does have the key from the device, then basically this reduces to a, an online attack, but on the RWD value, okay? Uh, network attacks are unconditionally secure because the communication has this one-time path thing. No PKI has been assumed. By the way, none of the works I'm showing now, or, or, or another way, all the works that, uh, yeah, that I'm showing uh, do not need a PKI, which uh, after many talks that showed us how bad PKI is, is a good thing. Uh, offline dictionaries attacks are invisible because of the randomness of the RWD. The only offline dictionary attack that is possible here is if the attacker gets the device and also the server, then it can run an offline attack, and that is basically unavoidable. 
Uh, online dictionary attacks are infeasible because of the randomness and independent RWDs. Uh, even there is some defense against password leakage. For example, if you find an RWD for one server, doesn't mean say anything about other RWDs. Even if you find a master password, you still need the device to, to, to authenticate. And there are some defenses also against uh, phishing by adding the URL into the PRF. Full security against password leakage or client of, uh, compromise requires two-factor authentication, and we also have some recent work uh, doing some uh, hopefully interesting stuff about two-factor authentication. I also list that in, this, in, the, in the list of in the references. Okay, the second part of the talk is about uh, how to protect valuable secrets when all you remember is a password, and here, protect, I mean both secrecy and availability. And valuable secrets, we have many examples from Bitcoin wallets, user control cloud backup, uh, like, uh, you know, if, like, like uh, Moti was doing. Uh, secure messaging keys, uh, how do you um, do things so th th that the user must be there to, to decrypt stuff. Uh, private keys for public key credentials, many, many, many examples. Um, now, since we want to protect both uh, secrecy and availability, in this case, just a, a single server is not enough. We need a multi-server solution. A single server would be a single point of failure for secrecy. If the, secret, the server is compromised and there is an offline dictionary attack against it, that can uh, compromise the, the secrecy. And availability, of course, if you have a single server, when the server is unavailable, the secret is unavailable too. So we want a, a multi-server solution, and of course, a, any cryptographer will tell you that the solution is to use a secret sharing scheme. And really, we want to share among n servers and be able to retrieve from T plus one servers, even if you, if you uh, secret is, uh, let's say, a, a, a Bitcoin wallet, doesn't mean that you need to do this to the Bitcoin wallet. The Bitcoin wallet, you, you encrypt and authenticate and put it wherever you want. You, you do the secret sharing to, to, to the key. And uh, you retrieve from T plus one servers. Le uh, availability is protected as long as T plus one uh, servers are available, and the secret is protected as long as no more than T of the servers is corrupted. Now we have a problem, because now the user will come to a server and say, give me back my share. Now, that, how does the server know who he should give the shares? If come, anyone that comes and gets the shares, then anyone can, gets the secret. So, of course, the server will have to authenticate the user, of course, using a password. What is the user going to do? He's going to choose the same password for all the servers. So now, instead of one uh, point of failure, we have n point of failures. Any server that is compromised, you find the, the, the password, and now you can access all, this, all the servers. So, of course, if you ask the user to choose the independ random independent uh, password for the different servers, that is uh, certainly unrealistic. So we have a problem with this approach. What we really want is this primitive called a password protected secret sharing, an, an, a notion that was introduced by Bagger Zandi et al. Uh, it has two stages, the initialization stage in which the user shares the secret among the end servers, after which the user forgets the secret completely, only remembers a password. At retrieval time, the user contacts T plus one server. The only thing that he remembers is the password, and that's enough for him to reconstruct the secret. And the security has to be that an attacker that breaks into T servers learns nothing about the secret or the password. Both of them are, are secure. And when I say that an attacker breaks into the servers, I mean it finds everything. It finds the shares, it finds the password uh, uh, file, and uh, any long-term keys. I'm not assuming anything that remains secure uh, on, on the server. The only uh, attack avenue after that is for, uh, is for the uh, attacker to try to guess your password and go to the, the, the servers, and if he, got, if he guesses the password, then it can impersonate. Otherwise, it has nothing that it can do. Offline attacks are, uh, use, are impossible as long as there are at most corrupted servers. I'll skip this one. 
And what we do is we give a very uh, surprisingly efficient uh, uh, scheme. Uh, it requires just uh, in the ret really. <laughs> That's really bad. Uh, let me see my, my situation. Wow. Uh, okay, it, uh, uh, where I am? So it's a single, a single exponentiation for, uh, for each server. The, the client does two exponentiations in total, independent of T and N, just two exponentiations. Um, and each one, the server and the client does do also T multiplications or additions in the elliptic curve implementation, which are inexpensive operations. The communication is a single message from the user to T plus one servers, uh, and, um, and one message is sent back from the server to the users. There is no communication between the servers. Now, there is no assumed, pick, no PKIs needed, no secure channels, other than for initialization, in which case the user wants to identify and authenticate the servers it is sharing the secret with, but not after that. And by the way, uh, Moti uh, mentioned that maybe secret sharing like this may not be practical enough or something like that. This, the cost of the thing is less than the cost of, of a TLS uh, interaction with the server. So uh, this is really, really inexpensive. And I will not uh, talk about how this looks, see the papers. What I'm going to do is uh, very fast tell you about this XPEC protocol, which is a protocol for this. If you have a single server situation, uh, what is the best protocol that you can run? And this is a protocol with very nice properties. By the way, this is the protocol that is our PPSS scheme, but uh, for the case n equals 1, t equals 1. And a very similar protocol was already uh, proposed by, by Boyan several years ago. Um, and I mean, I, I have slides to show how, uh, an idea of how this works. I will not be able to do that, but let me tell you what the properties of this thing are. Uh, are. Uh, so in any single server peak, what is called an asymmetric or augmented peak, you want that the security is such that if the server breaks into a, 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 if the attacker breaks into a server, it still needs to run an offline dictionary attack. For example, if you, share, if you put the, the user password in the clear inside the server, this is not a good solution. You want to force the attacker to do a dictionary attack. So that's something we always want in these kind of uh, servers. We want that no pre-computation prior to the time in which the attacker breaks the, 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 the server will uh, uh, help the, the, the attacker. Uh, this is what we use a, a secret salt for. Uh, we would like that the server will never see the password in plain text, no reliance on PKI, and if possible, to be able to offload the hash iterations that you do for key stretching on the user side, I mean, the, any, any balancing that you, you, you want to do. And the regular thing that we do now, password over TLS, has the first two properties, but it doesn't give you three, four, five. In particular, the, the server, when it decrypts the TLS, it sees the password in the plain text. Of course, it's very dependent on PKI. Without PKI, TLS breaks completely. And you cannot do this offloading if you don't want to reveal the, uh, the salt. Other, other protocols in this uh, uh, type of protocols in the literature gets one, three, and four, but the combination of two and five is actually unique or at least from the protocols I know, it's unique to, to this protocol, which actually has all the properties. So it's, 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 it's a very strong uh, protocol. Uh, I'll show you only one thing. The, to, to understand that protocol, you take Sphinx, as I showed before, and you just move the server to the side of the device, and that's it. And now you run the same protocol that you ran with the device before, you run it with the server, and this is all you need to do. Uh, and even if you want to do a full AKE, uh, authenticated key exchange, for example, with HMQV, you still get a two-message two protocol. Uh, if you want to do explicit client authentication, you need to add one more. Okay, uh, let me... Two minutes for conclusions? O one minute? One minute. So, summer, password. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so we all agree that uh, password vulnerability is a big problem. Uh, we, our goal was to show that password insecurity is not in inevitable. Uh, uh, cryptography has some uh, in interesting solutions in these different settings. Um, all schemes that I present are, have, uh, are based on security, formal security models and proofs of security. Uh, anyway, mature, efficient, simple technology just waiting to be deployed. And here you have the references. This is the, the la long one. You can, if you want to write down, it's enough. Alt URL AAXCV. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, in your first protocol, really elegant. I really liked it. You said uh, you can use it with uh, your Google or your employer or whatever. What if your employer uh, is one of these evil employers that forces you to change your passwords every 30 days? I hate that. I yeah, hate I hate that. Yes. But what do you do? Like, well, could you, in could you maybe look, just encrypt a don't password? Com don't confuse this? us with engineering problems. <laughs> Real no, world so, yeah, yeah, no. So, <laughs> very good question. Um, so, uh, the, the, the solution basically is that, I mean, the best solution you can think about is that you will keep a counter. Uh, you can, if, if, if you're willing to, to store your uh, accounts on the device, then it's easy because right. the account will, uh, will store the, the counter and it will be added to the PRF. If you do that, then it's simple. If you don't want to do that, then there is a problem. I mean, either the user will have to remember the, the counter or write it down or, you know, something and like also that. Also, if the, if the site you're trying to log into requires you to have a symbol and a number and a, like... Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. any, 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 anyway, the, the, there is another engineering question. What happens if the, the, the password cannot be a random password? It has to be three symbols like this and this and that. Uh, I mean, these are all solvable in one way or another, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so, but, but, but I don't think any of these things really kills the solution. Right? All right, why don't we thank uh, Ugo again. Thank you.